Microorganisms, or germs, are everywhere. They're found both in and on our bodies, as well as around us in the air, water, and earth. Some germs cause no harm. Some actually help to keep us healthy, and others can make us sick, sometimes extremely, extremely ill. Depending on your occupation, you may work in a field where you could potentially be exposed to an infectious agent in the workplace. Initially, you may be thinking, if I'm not a healthcare worker, this doesn't apply to me. This is not always the case. Let's consider a non-healthcare example together. In this scenario, you've been hired to renovate an older building. About a week after completing the job, you develop a fever, body aches, extreme tiredness, and a cough. You search the internet and self-diagnose yourself with the flu. As you can guess, a self-diagnosis is not recommended. Your symptoms don't improve over the next week and you seek medical advice via a telemed appointment. After some tests ordered by the doctor, it's determined that you have histoplasmosis, a disease caused by a fungus found in rodent and bird feces. Your doctor prescribes an antifungal medication and your symptoms clear up. Had you taken more precautions and worn personal protective equipment or PPE, this infection could have been avoided. Being aware of potential infectious agents, how they can spread, and having prevention and control methods in place are essential for the safety of everyone in the workplace. In this course, we'll be discussing what infectious diseases are and what causes infection, common infections including details on how they spread and who is most susceptible how to prevent and control infectious diseases, and the essential role and components of an exposure control plan in the workplace. Now, before we talk about what causes infectious diseases, examples of common infections, and the methods to prevent and control them, it's important to first define some key terms. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, defines an infectious disease as a sickness, illness, or loss of health caused by an infectious agent. But what are infectious agents? According to both OSHA and the CDC, infectious or biological agents are organisms including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites that have the ability to multiply and negatively affect the health of a susceptible host. Infectious agents cause an infection, an adverse reaction in the body. There are three things that are required to cause infection, often referred to as the epidemiologic triangle. They are an external agent or source, a susceptible host, and a route of transmission, the environmental factors that bring the host and agent together. Let's discuss these in a little bit more detail. Where did the germs come from? This is the external agent or source that enters and invades the body. Examples of sources include another person who may or may not be showing symptoms, dry surfaces like doorknobs, tables, or countertops, or wet surfaces like a sink or biofilm, a slimy surface-based microbial environment. Additional sources include dust or debris from construction or decay, including feces found in buildings or the soil. Sources can also be vector-borne, which means that an infectious agent has been transmitted by a living organism, such as a tick or flea, to a human or another animal. In the healthcare field, medical equipment, including IV lines and catheters, could serve as a home for infectious agents as well. Every source needs a susceptible host with the proper environment to invade and multiply within. There are many factors that play a role in how susceptible a host is, including age, current medications, and the status of your health. Both very young and old people are often more susceptible than others. Some medications, including some antibiotics, can cause the immune system to weaken while taking them. Certain medical conditions, including diabetes, cancer, and organ transplantation, increase susceptibility to infection. These factors aren't required to become infected with an infectious disease, but they do increase the risk. Finally, let's discuss how infectious diseases are transmitted. The main routes of transmission are contact, droplet, and airborne. Contact transmission is either direct via physical skin-to-skin -skin contact or indirect from a contaminated surface or an object. Droplet transmission involves infectious agents that are generated when a person coughs, talks, or sneezes. 
It can also occur during some medical procedures, including suctioning and intubating. Droplets are too large to stay airborne for long and are transmitted when they contact another person's eyes, nose, or mouth. Airborne transmission occurs when an infectious agent is carried by very small particles that can travel and remain in the air for greater periods of time. Airborne agents do not require face-to-face -face contact like droplet transmission does. Examples of contact droplet and airborne infectious agents include those that cause MRSA, influenza, and tuberculosis respectively. There are far too many different infections to be able to discuss them all. So instead, we'll discuss some common infections, including the common cold, seasonal flu, COVID-19, tuberculosis, and some occupational specific infections. The common cold is most often caused by a rhinovirus. It is usually mild and infects both children and adults. The virus is spread most often through droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes. They can also spread from direct contact or if a person touches a contaminated surface and then touches their eyes, nose, or mouth. Rhinoviruses are present year-round, but most people are affected in the fall and spring. Colds can be mistaken for allergies because the symptoms are often similar, often including a runny nose or nasal congestion, sore throat, and a cough. The seasonal flu is an infection caused by the influenza virus that can affect everyone but is most common in the healthcare industry than others. Symptoms often include fever, coughing, sore throat, congestion, and fatigue. The virus is transmitted by droplet transmission, coughing or sneezing, but can also be transmitted via contact transmission if hands or a surface are contaminated with the virus. It's referred to as a seasonal flu because cases peak in the winter from December through February each year. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19 and is highly infectious and can spread quickly. It's an infection that can affect everyone, but one where older people and those with conditions such as diabetes and cancer are more susceptible. The virus is transmitted via droplets or airborne particles when the infected person exhales, coughs, sneezes, or talks. There are many variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus caused by mutations over time. Symptoms often include fever, a dry cough, loss of taste or smell, and shortness of breath. The bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis causes tuberculosis, or TB, a highly contagious infection that occurs in the lungs and causes coughing, fever, and fatigue. The bacteria is transmitted through the air when an infected person talks, sneezes, coughs, or sings. Anyone exposed is a susceptible host. This is more common in healthcare, correctional facilities, and with zoo workers that work with elephants, as well as those that travel internationally to countries with high rates of TB. TB infections are most common outside of the United States in parts of Asia and Africa. For an infection to be categorized as an occupational infection, it must involve an infectious agent associated with the workplace and the job must include specific activities that could expose the worker to the agents. As with many other infectious diseases, these can often be prevented with vaccines, health education, and in-place preventive programs. Occupational infections are classified based on their routes of transmission. The table provides some of these modes of transmission with example infections and occupations, including transmission via animals or animal products, vectors like ticks and rodents, environmental factors like soil and from direct skin-to-skin -skin contact or through the air. In addition, depending on your work environment, you may require detailed and specific training on blood-borne pathogens. For this, additional training is available. Please seek out additional training as needed. Now that we've discussed some common infections, their symptoms, and routes of transmission, next we need to discuss various methods of prevention and control. Some infections can be prevented, or their symptoms reduced in severity, by getting a vaccine. Other infections can be prevented and controlled by following the universal precautions found in OSHA's Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, or by the expanded standard and transmission-based precautions, all written by the CDC. 
The universal precautions apply when workers are exposed to blood and other potentially infectious materials, including bodily fluids. The other precautions protect workers from an even wider range of infectious agents. All precautions treat blood, bodily fluids, etc. as if they are infectious at all times. Although infectious diseases have different routes of transmission, there are many common prevention methods. These precautions include following good hand hygiene and washing often, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, always covering your cough or sneeze, and wearing PPE when required. In addition, it's important to disinfect commonly touched objects and areas regularly, ensure that ventilation and air quality inside is adequate, and stay home if you feel sick. In addition, if you're potentially going to be exposed to an airborne infectious agent, wear specialized PPE such as a respirator or an N95 or better face mask. Finally, it's important that all workers are trained minimally once a year on how to use PPE and all preventions and control methods to prevent accidental transmission. The hierarchy of controls model is often used to reduce risk and create possible solutions for hazard, in this case infection, control, and prevention. It's also used for hazard control in the workplace and is represented by an upside-down triangle with five controls listed from the most to least effective. The top two tiers, elimination and substitution, involve completely removing the hazard and its risks or making a change to reduce the risk. Examples of elimination include isolation, quarantine, or orders to stay at home. Examples of substitution include working remotely instead of inside the office and doing activities outside instead of inside when possible. The third tier, engineering controls, does not eliminate the hazard completely, but is a method to separate people from them. Examples include adding barriers between people and improving ventilation and air purification. The fourth tier, administrative controls, involves new policies being put in place to change workers' behaviors. Examples include requiring set distances between others, mask mandates, and limiting the number of people allowed inside at one time. The final tier is PPE. Employers are required to provide adequate PPE as needed to its employees and train them on how to properly use, dispose, or disinfect it. How are employees made aware of the prevention and control methods in place? Any workplace where there is potential exposure to infectious agents must have an exposure control plan or ECP designed to reduce or eliminate exposure, and that is easily accessible to all employees. Updates are required annually. ECPs must include the following section, exposure determination, methods of compliance, bloodborne pathogen section, if applicable, communication of hazards, and record keeping. So let's explore these plans in more detail. The Exposure Determination section lists all job classifications that have potential occupational exposure and all tasks being performed that could lead to exposure. The Methods of Compliance section includes many subsections, so let's discuss a few of them. The General section reminds everyone that the universal precautions are in place. The Engineering and Work Practice Control section provides the regulations for hand washing, sharps, transportation materials, what to do if something becomes contaminated, and food and drink policies. The PPE section discusses the personal protective equipment and training that should be available to all employees. The housekeeping section discusses how to handle waste, sharps, and laundry. The communication of hazard section discusses the required fluorescent orange or orange red labels and signage for containers and within work areas. The record keeping section states that copies of medical, training, and incident records are kept on file from past exposures. Depending on your work environment, the plan may include two more completed sections on bloodborne pathogens, including a section on HIV and HBV, as well as one for hepatitis B. As needed, please seek out additional training. There are templates available to assist in the creation of an ECP for your workplace.
As we conclude our study on the control and prevention of infectious diseases, let's summarize the key concepts we've discussed. We discussed what an infectious disease is, what causes infection, and how infections spread. We explored common infections that occur in the workplace, their symptoms, and how they spread. We also examined methods followed to both prevent and control the spread of infectious diseases. Finally, we discussed the exposure control plan, its role in the workplace, and what information it contains for all employees. As a reminder, germs are everywhere, and some are helpful while others are harmful. Understanding what causes infectious diseases and how they spread, how to reduce the risk of being infected, and the plans in place to protect you in the workplace will help to keep you and your coworkers healthy. Illnesses will still occur, and when they do, it's important to seek medical advice versus self-diagnosis. Rely on professional advice and seek out additional training as needed.